find the fact that we have a Slack channel dedicated to this uh, particular token tutorial. Thank you so much, Nuria and Julia. And now we can leave the floor to Matteo and Jens for the next part of the day. All right, I don't have uh, screen sharing privileges at this moment. I joined or I exited and rejoined later. Just a second. Now you should have it. Yes, thank you. Okay. So welcome to this last little bit. Uh, this is about cross-correlation spectroscopy. Cross-correlation is something that always sounds a little bit fancy, uh, but it actually really connects nicely with what Julia and uh, Nuria have just been, uh, have just been showing. Uh, the point of cross-correlation is that instead of looking at one or two odd lines in your transmission spectrum or emission spectrum, uh, you're going to look at tens or hundreds or even thousands uh, at the same time and kind of sum them up to increase the signal to noise. So if you were, not positively impressed by the signal noise that Julia just showed you. In certain cases, uh, cross correlation will be able to by adding a lot of lines if you have them uh, to uh, increase that uh, in order to detect things uh, at a higher significance. Of course, this depends a lot on, on what you're looking at. For sodium, you can't really do this because there is only two lines uh, and you have to do direct spectroscopy uh, on them. Uh, but in certain cases, uh, you will have a lot of lines to work with, and then you can combine them and uh, see the lines, strengths, profiles in a lot more detail. Um, we're going to do this uh, today in two cases. Uh, I'm going to show you the optical version uh, using metals in, in ultra-hot Jupiters, as an example. We're going to use the uh, high-resolution spectra of Harps North in order to do this. Um, then after about 45 minutes, Matteo will take over, and he's going to show us how to do this in the infrared uh, with molecules um, and not transit spectroscopy, but uh, actual emission day side spectroscopy, which uses the exact same concepts, but because you are now on the day side and because you're in the infrared, things change a, change a little bit. Um, there is also different um, implementations of how people do cross correlations uh, in the literature and Matteo and I use slightly different conventions. So I hope that by the end of this, you will have a bit of a sense of the scope uh, that there is out there and and the uh, different sort of different choices people uh, sometimes sometimes make. Um, I'm also going to be writing code live. So we're going to start off with the pipeline reduced uh, data products coming out of Harps North. And in about 45 minutes, we'll end up with an actual detection in cross correlation space uh, of, uh, of, in this case, iron in the atmosphere of Kelt 9b. Kelt 9b is, uh, is uh, uh, the hottest exoplanet known. Um, its atmosphere is, uh, depending on where you measure, about 4,000 uh, 4, K. And that means that the entire atmosphere is essentially uh, uh, atomic, vaporized. There is no or very, very few molecules. And that means that there is a lot of uh, metal lines that we can observe. And in this example, we're going to be using iron plus, uh, just as an example. But there's many things that you can, uh, that you can see in that spectrum. Um, as well as other other uh, ultra hot Jupiters, uh, the, the planet that that Matteo is going to look at is a more ordinary hot Jupiter, where instead of uh, atomic absorption, you'll be looking more at molecular uh, molecular uh, absorption. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, make use of the the spectral orders that are extracted by the Harps North pipeline. Uh, that's a typically a data product that you could be starting off with, uh, regardless of whether you're using Harps or Harps North or Carmenes or Espresso. Um, we're going to uh, read uh, the wavelength solutions that are produ produced by the pipeline. We're going to use the observing dates to figure out whether the planet is transiting along with the orbital parameters. We're going to do some of these velocity corrections as well. I'm very happy that Julia and Nuria gave such an excellent introduction to those because that means that I can spend 10 minutes less explaining all of those uh, shifts that we're going to see. Um, standard Python packages as well as AstroPy uh, to mostly to deal with FITS files, but also to use uh, units. I really love the unit package in AstroPy. It, it uh, saves a lot of trouble. If you haven't seen that, pay attention towards the end because AstroPy units are, are really, uh, really nice. Finally, I'll give you three functions that do some, some sort of important, but, but, but not so, um, uh, I mean, important functions that, 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 that will help us uh, do stuff that, that I don't want to explain, um, that are quite routine. Uh, utility functions, I'll give you those free of charge. Um, and finally, because we're doing cross correlation, we also need uh, model spectra uh, to use as cross correlation templates. So we'll be using those to, uh, 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 for iron plus in this case, 
uh, in order to make our uh, spectrum or to make our uh, lines visible. The picture that we're using in this data set is very similar. We have a time series of observations. Uh, we start just before the transit um, where the planet is blue shifted uh, because it's moving along this, along this orbit. In the case of Kelp 9b, the orbital velocity is 250 about meter per se uh, kilometer per second, which gives us uh, a velocity shift of, of many tens of kilometers per second going through the transit. So we start before the transit starts. At some point, this, the, the planet starts transiting. The transmission spectrum appears with all of the spectral lines in it. Those shift through wavelength because of the Doppler effect. And then at the very end, um, the planet goes out of transit. Now it has a redshift of tens of kilometers per second. And the equation for this is uh, sort of summarized here, and we'll be using that one that one later. It's a very simple, um, uh, a simple calculation. Actually, you just project the orbital velocity according to the orbital phase, which is this this parameter. And the orbital velocity, I usually uh, because I'm a bit lazy, I usually use a, a circular orbit. Um, so that is two pi a divided by the orbital period to give the orbital velocity. And for Kelp nine, that is, and many other hot Jupiters actually, that is in excess of 100 kilometers per second, which is very easily resolved using these high resolution spectrographs. The cross-correlation function uh, itself, this is the whole crux of the, of the, of the method. Um, cross-correlation is actually a bit of a misnomer. In my case, I, I use a, a, a mathematical operation that is actually identical to a weighted average. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to sum over the multiplication of the data, which I call X uh, or XI, the, the spectral pixels that are in our data set. Those are taken at time t because we have a time series of observations. So we have something like, like 50 of these, um, which means that there are 50, 50 x, y's, and we sum over those uh, in the spectral direction multiplied by a template, which uh, is a model of our, or prescribes where our spectral lines are. So this thing has uh, values at wavelengths where there is a spectral line, and we make it zero whenever we are not inside a spectral line. So when you're doing this, uh, multiplication, you're only weighing or you're only counting pixels in the data that are coinciding with spectral lines uh, of the species that we're interested in. Now, this template is shifted to a certain velocity because we're going to test it at different, uh, different uh, possible uh, velocity steps. And whenever the template is shifted to the correct velocity, it is going to overlap all of these lines with the lines that are presumably present in the data. And then this is going to give us a signal. Um, we divide by, so the thing underneath uh, uh, is the sum of the template, which essentially only says that this is a, a, a normalized uh, uh, operation. So the template itself can be a, a weighting function that is scaled, uh, scaled by any constant and the outcome does not, does not care about this. This is literally the same function that you would use if you're supposedly in high school and you get a whole bunch of grades, which all weigh differently. This is how you average them together. Um, uh, it's, it's nothing more complicated than that. Matteo is going to use a slightly, slightly different version of this where, where, where things are normalized uh, a little bit differently. But essentially what this does is averaging uh, these lines together. And the purpose of this is to uh, increase the signal noise. So you're add, adding pixels that all are noisy and then the noise goes down the more pixels you add. Now out comes a function that is two dimensional. So the cross correlation C is two dimensional because we are shifting the template over a range of velocities and we have spectra taken over a range of times. So we get these two dimensional plots, which are very similar to what Nuria and Julia just showed, uh, but in wavelength space, now they are in rate of velocity space because you have, uh, you have uh, taken a template and shifted it. You could actually also have expressed these in, in, in velocity spaces uh, before because those are equivalent through the Doppler effect. This is a, a subpanel of a uh, of a cross correlation function of Kelp 9b that is taken from uh, our 2019 paper on this uh, on this uh, uh, planet on this data set, um, and here you can actually see the the signal of the the metals appearing adding constructively when the template is shifted to the correct orbital velocity and that uh, correct uh, rate of velocity, excuse me, and that velocity changes as we go through the transit because of this uh, curvature in the orbit. Um, and you can see really nicely that that this is uh, that this is uh, detectable even in, in single in single uh, uh, exposures um, uh, as the transit is progressing. So you can really do time resolved uh, spectroscopy by adding all of these lines together. Okay, so starting off with the data that we are that we're looking at, um, we are using Harps North data. As I said, the pipeline produces uh, essentially two main uh, uh, products. One of them is the stitched spectrum that that uh, LER also showed in the beginning. Um, and I'm showing you here. 
Uh, you can see that Kelp 9 uh, is, uh, is a bit of a peculiar star. The spectrum doesn't look like anything that, uh, that Julia and uh, Nuria and uh, Elia were showing earlier, because this is a very fast rotating star. You barely see any spectral lines. Uh, the ones that you do clearly see are these, those are the, those are the Balmer lines of hydrogen. And besides that, you see a little bit, um, and these are all sort of spectral lines, but they are very broad as well. This is a fast rotating A star with uh, a V sine I of about 100, 110 kilometers per second, which means that all of these lines actually blend together into sort of pseudo continuum. The lines that are present are these, which are the bands of uh, telluric oxygen and water. And if you are writing a science paper, you will be correcting those using a software called Molecfit, or like Molecfit. But in this case, because our metal lines are very much uh, clustered in the blue, we can actually get away with not, not actually dealing with these. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm not, not actually going to, I'm going to pretend that these are not there at all. In reality, you would be using something like Molecfit to, to correct them. All right, so let's get started with code. Um, these are the three functions that I'm, uh, that I'm using, going to provide. Um, the first one is reading the wavelength solution from the uh, uh, FITS headers. Uh, these are encoded as fourth order polynomials with coefficients that are all listed in the header. And these, uh, uh, this function essentially loops through those and sort of extracts them in order to provide a wavelength array along with every flux array that we extract from the, from the FITS, FITS files. A function to convert modified Julian dates, which are also provided in the header to bare centric Julian dates. We're going to correct for a light travel time. This is an example that I, or this is a piece of code that I literally lifted off of the AstroPy uh, documentation pages. You could do the same or lift it off from me. I don't take credit for this. And finally, converting um, wavelengths from air to vacuum. Very often, observed trees or pipelines will produce uh, spectra that are in air because the Earth's atmosphere has a, uh, a slight uh, uh, index of refraction that's slightly higher than vacuum, all wavelengths shift. Um, usually when you make models, they are calculated in vacuum. So you have to shift between these two frames in order to make a comparison. If you have a template in vacuum and your, your, your observations are in air, you have, to, you have to make them compatible. So we're going to be shifting our, our uh, data from air to vacuum to make, those two, uh, to make that conversion. Um, and that's it. We can then start uh, by, uh, by starting to read our data. I'm not going to use the 1D spectra. I'm actually going to use the 2D extracted spectra because the 1D spectra have had an interpolation step, a resampling step applied to them. Uh, these spectral orders are, if you imagine a, sh a shellogram, they are imaged onto the CCD, sort of stacked up in these, uh, in these uh, uh, um, uh, chunks. Um, and in order to make the 1D spectrum, the pipeline has to do a couple of things, including resampling, but also dealing with the overlaps. And those are operations that we don't actually need to do. So I'd like to stay closer to the, to the, to the native uh, thing that the spectrograph sees, which is the individual extractive spectral orders. And those are uh, saved in what are called these E2DS files. So um, I've provided a folder if, you, if you're coding along, uh, otherwise you can just watch. I've provided a, 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 a folder where these are uh, located. And we're going to uh, read them into, into a list. You'll see that I do a lot with lists um, to structure my data. So we're going to uh, open these. Um, I'm going to first maybe uh, list what is in this folder. I use the uh, list there function for that. The folder is called E2DS. Um, and I can actually print that. You can see that there's a whole bunch of these uh, FITS files, and each of these files is one of the exposures that we are, uh, that the spectrograph has, has obtained over the course of the transit. Uh, let's see how many there are. I think there's about 50 of them. Right, there's 49 of these, some of them in transit, some of them out of transit. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, read these into our, uh, in, into memory. So I'm going to uh, use the FITS, uh, uh, package or the Fitch sub package of, of AstroPy. I've, I've imported astropy.io.fits as fits. So this is simply uh, astropy.fits, astropy.io.fits uh, open. Uh, and I'm going to go into that folder. And let's say that we're going to read in the first, uh, the first of these um, as file. And so what is in this fits file? Okay, we have got a, a data array. Um, I'm going to call that E2DS. And that's in the zeroth extension or the first extension, which is extension zero dot data. That is a fits image. Um, I can read in the header, which is file zero dot header. 
Um, and finally, we also have wavelength axis, which we need, which uh, I'm going to use that function for. That's called read wave from header. And I provide simply the header object, and it's going to uh, return us this, uh, uh, this wavelength. Um, and what I can do, for example, let's first of all plot the, plot the E2DS file itself. This is what you would see if you would open this uh, file with a fits, fits viewer. I often use DS9 and you see something very similar. And these are all the spectral uh, orders that the spectrograph has. There's about 70 of those uh, stacked together. Um, so the X axis has pixel positions, which runs from zero to 4,096. And there are 70 of those, each of these rows covering a uh, sequence or a chunk of wavelength of the spectrograph. Now I can also plot a single one of these spectral orders. Um, so with this, uh, I'm going to plot the wavelength axis of order number 68 versus row number 68 of this image. And that's going to show us a wavelength versus flux of order number 68. And this is, I chose this one because you actually see the uh, uh, telluric lines of, of oxygen. This is one of the last spectral orders and it has this big oxygen band. Uh, I can also go, I think 56 is sodium if I remember that correctly. Maybe not, uh, but you can see that that uh, overall the, the spectrum is very smooth because this is a fast rotating A star. Lots of orders actually look like this. If there's no telluric lines, you barely see any, any spectral features. And for the purpose of this uh, cross correlation or this transmission spectroscopy, actually, this is a quite nice property because you don't have to deal as much with stellar, uh, stellar spectral lines. Okay, um, now there's one thing that you should note, and that is that the wavelength axis is in angstroms. I actually don't like that. I usually do things in nanometers. That is a personal thing. So I'm going to divide by 10 in order to uh, make those into uh, nanometers. And now we are, now we are. Of course, this is not sodium. Sodium is probably uh, maybe 55 or even 54. I don't know. You see some of these wire lines here that are, they are overlapping with the sodium, sodium uh, doublet as well. So anyway, we're going to proceed with this. Um, this is one of them. Um, one of these spectral orders. I can also make a plot of, of all of the spectral orders or a, 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 a set of these spectral orders. So you can see how, how many there are, how wide this data actually is. So this is plotting for uh, order number 50 to order number 69. I'm plotting simply this thing, but I'm over plotting it in the same, in the same plot. Is it Harps North? This is Harps North, yes. Because otherwise, if it's, oh, Harps North. So in Harps, it's 56, Julia is saying. Yeah, I thought I thought so too. Um, uh, that's why I was thinking fifty six, but that's Harp South. Harp's North is uh, slightly different. The layout is slightly different. Yeah. Maybe this is now fifty four or something. I, it doesn't matter, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but do you have sodium? Calc nine. Uh, we do. Yes. We we can talk about that in a bit. Uh, you, you can use cross correlation for sodium if it's hot enough, because there's other lines. In the in the atom, all the transitions in the atom that get activated at, at high high temperature. So here you actually see the stellar sodium lines, and that's very different from from the stellar lines that Julia just showed. And that's simply because this is uh, this is uh, such a fast rotating star. You also see two very deep ones over here, which I believe are are uh, interstellar uh, uh, sodium absorption. We're also going to ignore all of that. Okay. So here we have plotted uh, a whole uh, array of these spectral orders from order number 50 to 69. So this is like a third of our data. And you can see that there's a lot of them. You also see that they're overlapping. Um, the pipeline deals with that overlap when, it, when it's stitching the spectra together. We're not going to have to deal with that, actually. We can, we can pretend that these are uh, separate chunks. And we don't really care about what the wavelength, wavelengths are because our cross-correlation function, if we scroll back up here, this thing actually does not really care about wavelengths. So the template will have wavelengths associated to it, but once this multiplication is done, um, it doesn't really matter what wavelength came from where. So that, that's actually a property that we're going to be using a little bit later when we construct this data and push it through that function. Okay, now this is one of, the, one of our exposures. Okay, we have, we have these 70 spectral orders in each of our exposures. We've got something like 49 or 50, uh, 49 exposures. Um, that taken during the time series. So this is a multidimensional data set that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and first of all, we're going to, of course, have to read those in. So I'm going to make a bunch of lists within which I'm going to do that. So I'm going to make a list of these. I've got one of, one of them over here. I'm going to make a list of those, track their uh, spectral fluxes, the wavelength axes associated with those spectral fluxes. And also I'm going to track the date and the bare centric velocity correction that the pipeline has actually provided uh, calculated and provided in the fit header as well. So 
I'm going to start a for loop with which I'm going to loop through all of these files. So I'm going to call f in file list. And I essentially am going to just copy what I just did here. For one file, I'm now going to do it for uh, all of these files, OK? Um, something about tabs, one, two, three. Uh, file list zero is, of course, we're going to going to become f, f in file list. And I am not going to read them into these parameters, but I'm going to append them to these lists. So I'm basically going to say um, list of e to the s dot append uh, this data as well for, uh, I guess, the header I don't need, but I'm going to do that for the wavelength. And and I said I wanted to have the J, the dates and the bare center velocities as well, so I'm going to uh, read those out of the header. Um, and those come from header keywords. So AstroPy reads this in as a big kind of dictionary, so I can index that that if I know the the, the header uh, keyword that, that that has it. That contains it in this case it is mjd ops and for the bear centric correction it is a bit more uh, complicated and you have to know this or you have to look it up in the header or the documentation uh, of your instrument but that is hierarch tng for the telescope where this instrument is on drs birth that contains the bear centric velocity and the julian date Okay, so let's see that actually worked. So I can simply say, well, I'm going to print my MJDs. This takes a few seconds, of course, because it's now reading in 50 files. And you can see that these MJDs were, were read in. We also see that they're not sorted. In time, we're going to sort them in a second. Let's look at the barycentric uh, velocities. Of course, I shouldn't have done that by re for reading them in again, but this is like a couple of uh, 4.9, 4.9, 5 point something. Uh, these are kilometers per second, so I'm going to have to deal with these as if they are kilometers per second later when I'm going to shift my uh, shift my spectrum. Okay. Now, maybe there's one thing I should still be doing. Um, I can do that at, at any stage, uh, but one thing I want to do is, I, as I said, I want to shift these to vacuums, so I'd rather do that straight away. So I'm going to call my air to vac function to make all of these into uh, vacuum wavelengths. And I think this is one of the most important things in, in high resolution spectroscopy when you're doing this. It's, 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 it's possible to be in any uh, of a couple of frames. You can be in the Earth's frame, you can be in the barycenter, you can be in the stellar frame, you can be in air or in vacuum. And, and a lot of the complexity comes from not knowing exactly what frame you are in or what frame you should be in. So it's very important to, to be aware at any time what frame we are we're actually in. Okay, so we have essentially read our entire data folder into, uh, two, into four lists. Uh, that contain the information that we need. We can now uh, plot some of those. Uh, again, I'm going to plot uh, order number 68. And this is now a list of lists, actually. So we've become two dimensional. I've got list of wavelengths, file number 10, the 10th file in our time series, and order number 68. That's what I'm going to plot. Same for our flux arrays, flux array, file number 10, order number 68. So I can plot these things together. You can see that we again have our spectral order back. It looks a lot like what we just had as the first file. Um, I can overplot a couple of these to sort of show uh, uh, how these changes over time. So I'm going to take file number 10 and 20 and 30 and 40, just overplot four of them to sort of see what's going on with our, with our spectra. And you can see that they kind of overlap with each other. Uh, they're not exactly the same, but they, they look very similar. And that is good because Hart's North is a highly stabilized spectrograph. You would expect it to have very similar spectral response if you take an exposure and another exposure 10, 10 minutes later. This instrument was designed to be stable on sort of way, a meter per second uh, velocity scales on baselines of years. So you expect that these spectra are going to be very similar. But there are uh, shifts, um, and that's because the amount of light that the spectrograph captures changes from time to time. And that's because of, for example, weather, uh, air mass, um, the fiber might not be centered exactly on the star all the time, which means that the effective throughput goes up or down a little bit as we as we uh, as we go through our time series, and that is something that 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 Julia was just normalizing out. We're also going to be normalizing normalizing out in that out in a very similar way. Um, okay, so that brings us to step two. Um, we're going to have to sort our spectra in time. We're going to normalize out this flux difference, 
Uh, that's mostly actually for plotting purposes. We don't really need to do that for the cross correlation function, but it makes things uh, a little bit uh, nicer to, to plot. Um, the shifting to vacuum wavelengths, I see that I was repeating that, but I'm, I've just done that. As, as I said, it doesn't really matter when you do that. But one important step is that we're also going to do this, um, this data shuffle. So instead of working with a list of exposures, each of which containing a lot of spectral orders, we're going to swap this around and we're going to make a list of spectral orders, each of which contains a list of uh, exposures that are taken in time. So I've tried to demonstrate that with this little, little uh, sort of graphic. Um, and this looks a little bit complicated because we're going to do this again in, in a double for loop. It looks a bit complicated when we're doing it, but it's going to produce plots uh, that of the same nature that, that Julia was actually just using as well. So I hope that's, that, that by the end of this, it's going to look a little bit murky when I'm going to write this up, but it's going to uh, make a lot of sense when we are actually going to plot this data. So to start off with that, let's first do the sorting. Um, I'm actually not. I'm actually not going to do that live because this is simply the same thing uh, for four different uh, arrays. What I'm going to call is um, arc sort on MJD. I'm going to uh, sort these in uh, according to MJD. MJD is an, an ever increasing number, so any uh, any exposure that comes after another has a has a larger MJD. So we can use this to to actually sort in time. And that sorting, I'm going to apply to each of the arrays. So I'm going to take the MJD array and I'm going to index it with this sorting uh, with this sorting uh, uh, applied. I can actually sort of show what the sorting uh, is. Sorting. So you can see, for example, that the first file that we read in is actually number 13 in our time series. The first, the first uh, spectrum taken in time is somewhere halfway uh, down our file list. And this can actually be random. Uh, I don't know exactly how list they are lists uh, lists these files that might actually be a random listing. So these indices we can use now to sort all of our arrays um, in time. That is the easy step. Okay. So after this, um, sorting should have been done, and I can actually check that this has happened by printing MJD again. And now you can see that this is a number that increases from 0 0.87, 0 0.88, 0 0.89, uh, etc. So this has now uh, made our spectra sort of uh, be chronological. Okay, now we're going to do that reshuffling. So we want to end up with, instead of a list of files, a list of orders. So I'm gonna make two empty lists again to contain those. And we're going to fill those in uh, using a for loop. I want to loop over all the files that I have. So I'm going to loop from zero to the number of exposures that I have, which is 49. Okay. Um, and what I'm, so what I'm gonna end up with is a list of, 70 or so orders, and each of those is going to have 50 rows in it. That's what I'm going to build up. So I'm going to start looping over my spectral orders and build up every order step by uh, one by one. So I'm going to go I in range 0 to 69. That's my last spectral order. And I'm going to make a matrix that's going to contain these spectra. So that's going to be an empty uh, array, an X, which is 49 by 4,096, uh, I guess I don't need to do that, like so. And then every row of these, uh, of, the, of the spectral order, I'm going to fill it in with an exposure that belongs there. So uh, I'm now going to loop over my files and basically lift them uh, out, of their, uh, out of their list, essentially. So for each of my files, I'll simply say order row number J, is going to be list of e to the s file number j and order number i, which is in the outer loop. So order number i is going to be filled in with, with file number or spectrum number j, essentially. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to append this to my list of orders, append order. And I'm also going to do this for my wavelength axes of waves. And the nice thing about HARPS is that it's a highly stabilized spectrograph, which means that the wavelength axis is actually the same for all of our spectral orders because the calibration was done uh, at once in the night, uh, at the start or the end of the night. Um, and the wavelength solution changes very little from day to day. So we're going to make an approximation that if it's not even, it could even be exact for the for this spectra. I think for HARPS itself is actually exact. For HARPS, I'm not 100% sure. But the, the changes in wavelengths are minimal over the course of the night. So we're only going to use wavelength array from the first file for all of our 
uh, spectral orders, and that reduces the dimension dimensionality of our wavelength axis. This is going, still going to be a two-dimensional uh, list of orders, or a three-dimensional list, I would say, a uh, list of 2D orders, and this is going to be a list of 1D waves. That's how you should read this, or 2D waves. Um, okay, so let's then plot our order number uh, 68 again. Uh, say what? List of waves, list of waves, of course. Okay. <laughs> um, you got an extra 2D, Jens? Where is that? It's an extra 2D there that is not defined before. This one? No, it should be. It was here. Ah, okay. No, sorry. Uh, what am I doing? I've done this one. All right. So if you don't know what's going on, you just have to print what's going. On. You have to print your uh, of waves to be. Yeah, and is it supposed to be square brackets rather than round brackets around list of waves? Oh, you are a hero. Thanks. Of course, I need to append this. What am I doing? This is not a. This is not indexing. This is an appending. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hero. So uh, this is the same plot as above. Uh, this one, we've got four out of these rows plotted here, and here they're simply stacked in a single uh, array. And this is what we're going to be using. Using, and this is very. This is the same as what Julia was showing earlier with the sodium doublet. Now our vertical lines are not stellar lines, but they are actually tellurid lines because uh, the star doesn't have very, very, uh, very sharp lines. You wouldn't actually see those. Now you see also this um, flux changing over the course of our, our of our transit over the course of our night. And we're going to normalize that out. So I'm going to finally make a new list. And this is the final list of uh, data that we're going to be working with to uh, actually store those. So let's, what I want to do is the following. I want to have one of my orders. Let's say that is list of orders of orders, number 68. And what I'm going to want to do is do something like uh, order normalized equals order divided by its temporal mean. So I'm going to say, um, sorry, not by its temporal mean, by its uh, wavelength mean. Because the flux that I want to divide by in order to normalize these is essentially just the sum of, of, of all the flux in each of these orders. So this one is, for example, twice as bright as that one. Then I want to divide by a factor of two uh, this one compared to that one. So I'm going to take the average of each of these in the horizontal direction. And I would basically do that by saying order comma axis equals one. And you can do this, this is a NumPy trick where you take a spectral order and you are going to divide it row by row by uh, a one dimensional uh, uh, array that matches the shape of this order. That's a, that's a NumPy trick. So this division is a row by row division of this thing. Now that doesn't work because this um, average has 49 values in it. Those are the vertical axis. But row by row means that it's going to take this row and divide it by that thing, which means that they don't uh, broadcast. So to apply this NumPy trick, I have to transpose this first to swap rows and columns. Then I can, I can divide, and then I have to transpose it back. So that's, that's how this uh, is num NumPy trick usually goes. And then I can, uh, again, plot that uh, order norm in this case. So that's order number 68 again. And you can see that this has now taken care of, of these flux differences. I don't need to do this for the cross-correlation function, but it makes it a little bit nicer to see what is going on with our data. It's good to inspect your data in this way. All right, this was order number 68. Of course, I want to do this in a loop. So I'm going to construct a loop over this for I and range all of my orders. That's going to be a len uh, list of orders, something like 69. Um, and I'm simply going to do that. So I'm going to index using uh, I. I am going to calculate order norm, transpose it, divide row by row, transpose it back, and then append it to my list of orders norm and order norm. Okay, And that is it. I can now check that that has worked. List of orders norm 68. And now the image shouldn't uh, shouldn't actually change. Okay, 
that's good. So finally, this is the data that we are going to be using to cross correlate with. Okay, step three, we need a cross correlation template. And um, I'm going to do that easy because I've provided those. Uh, a cross correlation template is something that you would typically model using uh, any, any software that, uh, that uh, models uh, transmission spectra in this case. You could use petit drop trans, you could use something else. Uh, these were uh, actually used to, to analyze the Kelp9 data originally. Um, so I, would, uh, 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 I will just use those. You can also use any model that you have. You can also do it by hand by saying, I want to have the, the, these 10 lines of certain species, and I'm going to weigh them in such and such. Um, this is just a, just a way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, or modeling a transmission spectrum is just a way of creating a template, but there's other choices you can make. Um, these are located uh, in the uh, templates subdirectory um, with a file name that essentially describes what is in it. So this is a template that is calculated at 4,000 Kelvin, metallicity of solar, that's one, for iron plus. This is a model that was made by Daniel Kitzman originally for our, for our paper um, with which we correlate. We also have in the in the folder you will find uh, templates of other species as well, including iron and titanium, uh, neutral and ionized. Uh, so you can play with those detections as well. And this uh, is a fits image that essentially has two rows in it, which is a wavelength and a flux. So I will simply extract those by saying the wavelength of my template is TP row number zero, and the flux of my template is TP one. And then I can plot those uh, against each other. And then you can see the spectrum of iron plus. Okay, so these, this, this prescribes where our, uh, our spectral lines are. Now, as I said, the template needs to be continued normalized, which means that at places where there is a line I wanted to have values and in between uh, lines, I want it to be zero. So I need to continue normalize this to, to, to do that. This is a model of a transmission spectrum. This is not a template yet. So in order to do that, I'm actually going to uh, cheat a little bit uh, you could make some sort of an algorithm that fits the top envelope of this with a polynomial, or you can smooth it and then filter it in, that, in, in a certain way. The way I'm going to do this is by actually cheating and using a, another template, which is a uh, another species, which is boron 2+, plus, which doesn't have any lines, only Jeff, contains sorry. continuing information. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. There is a question in the chat. Maybe I missed by David. Maybe I missed it, but why aren't you removing the telluric lines? Isn't this affecting your final results? Yes, it is. Um, but in this case, it is not, because we are talking about. So you can actually see this in this in this model. Um, most of our lines that we are that are falling in our wave band are from 300 to 700 nanometers. That's our wave band. Most of those are in the blue, whereas all of our tellurics are more or less here. So to first order, um, we do not care about the telluric lines. Uh, Matteo is going to show you a bit more about, about, uh, about this, where we definitely care a lot about telluric lines. So this particular example, um, for this particular species, we don't care, but normally speaking, you would be using something like molecular to take care of them. This is just for, for, for the purpose of demonstration, really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off um, uh, the, the flux of my continuum species, um, and then you will see that this is actually ending up continuum normalized. So that's a bit of a cheat, um, but, uh, but that's sometimes, uh, if it works, uh, I'm always saying it, if it works, you should just do it. Um, with about five, six minutes on the clock, I'm going to go five minutes over, Matteo, if that's, if that's okay. Um, we're going to be doing a cross correlation now. Um, and in order to do this, we have to take care of a couple of things. We have our template. Our template um, is this thing. We need to shift it to a certain velocity. And uh, the shifting, as, as, as Julia just showed, is actually, is actually quite straightforward uh, to, to, to do by you just take your wavelength array and you're going to apply a Doppler factor to it and that shifts your spectrum. So uh, that Doppler factor, I call it beta, and that is simply going to be one uh, minus V over C. So my velocity would be something like, say, five kilometers per second. I'm now going to use uh, AstroPy units and constants. So I'm going to multiply by kilometer divided by second. Um, and then I'm going to divide this by constant uh, C uh, to take care of everything in kilometer per second, uh, both C and, uh, and, uh, and my velocity over here. And then all I need to do is basically say the wavelength of my template is going to be shifted. And that is the wavelength of the template times this Doppler factor. That's going to shift it, okay? Plotting those, so I'm gonna plot my template and the shifted template, and you should see that the shift has, uh, has emerged actually. Um, so the blue line is the normal template and the orange one is the shifted template. 
five kilometers per second is not a lot. So I can make this larger, for example, 25. And you can see that this makes my template shift, um, depending on what number I, I sort of choose here. So doing this cross correlation function, we're going to loop over a whole bunch of these velocities in order to make this shift happen. Okay. Now that is one thing. Uh, the second thing is interpolation. Like, uh, like uh, with Julia, in Julia's case, we also need to interpolate. This time, we're going to interpolate the template onto the data because um, this multiplication can only happen if x and t are defined on the same grid. So xi and ti need to correspond to the same wavelength position, and for that, we need to do an interpolation. We're not going to interpolate the data. We're not going to touch it. We're only going to interpolate the template, the wavelength grid of the template, onto the data. Um, we can do that uh, assuming that the template is sampled uh, much more uh, frequently than the, than the, than the data, which, which I actually show you and should show you that now in a second. So um, how does this interpolation work? I'm going to be lazy again. I'm not going to use splines or anything. I'm just going to use a, a simple one-dimensional interpolation. I'm using the SciPy interpolate uh, package to do this. Uh, interp 1D, my, um, my model, my template. Uh, Two more questions. Yes. Could you please describe the method you used to normalize the template? And uh, is that already convolved with the IP? Oh, good question. Good question. So the, the cross curl, the continuum subtraction, I've done that using a species that doesn't have any lines, only continuum flux, because this is a model. I have a model of my continuum plus lines, and I subtract the model of my continuum essentially only. That was an easy, an easy way of continuum normalizing. You could also have an algorithm that does it uh, very, very nicely. A filtering or, or something like that. I have not convolved with the instrument profile. We actually don't need to do this. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that on, in, on Slack if you want to, because we're not template matching. We're not modeling our, our spectral, uh, uh, our, our transmission spectrum. We're simply assigning weight to spectral pixels. And I do not need to, mo to, to convolve with the, with the uh, instrument function. But maybe we can discuss that offline a little bit because we're, I don't want to eat into, uh, into Matteo's time too much either. I still have a question on the normalization thing. Okay. So, a new person from Aaron. To continue to normalize, why do you choose the subtraction and not division? Ah, um, because it's a detail really. I could do a, a division and then you would end up with a template that has values around one, which means that every spectral pixel is weighted, but some of them will be weighted less if there are spectral lines. Okay, if I do a division here, so this is now one, and we have a little bit less than that whenever there's a spectral line, which means that every, every one of my X values will now be weighted when summing. Whereas what I want to achieve is that the cross correlation only weighs lines that are actually, only weighs wavelengths where there's actually lines and not in between. So that's why I do subtraction. Um, the cross correlation method will still work, but the interpretation of what this number is will change a little bit, but we can discuss that offline as well. Um, okay, so we interpolate this interp 1D function essentially works by passing wavelength uh, and fluxes. And then uh, as a function, where what do I want to interpolate onto, which is the uh, wavelength of my data, list of waves, let's say order number 10, that's what I want to interpolate onto. Um, and I can show that this works simply by um, overplotting the template with the interpolated template. So I take my template from one wavelength grid to the other. And you can see that the blue, the blue thing is my template and the red dots are the samples of my actual data grid. So you can see this is also why I'm doing a linear interpolation because, because this is sampled so well that I actually don't need a, uh, I don't need a spline to make, to make this accurate. And now the nice thing is that I can do my, my wavelength shift, my Doppler shift in the same call. So in this interpolation, I can actually apply my, my velocity shift um, and that will shift and interpolate at the exact same time. And this is what we're going to loop over when we do the cross correlation function. Okay, so the cross correlation function is a two dimensional uh, 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 function. It needs the wavelength, sorry, the, the rate of velocity of the template that I'm shifting to. That's going to be an array of values. So that's going to be a range minus 100 to 101 kilometers per second. So these are 200 kilometers per second uh, 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 range in steps of one kilometer per second. For example, you can, you can choose a range that you want. We're going to do minus 100 to plus 100. My CCF itself is that two dimensional function. So I'm gonna first make it empty and then we're going to fill it in in a double for loop um, that has a length of 
49 exposures, one for every one in the time series, and uh, a number of these velocity steps wide. That's my two dimensions. Um, and now how we're going to pass this data through, because the data has is a list of all of these spectral orders. And uh, the thing that you need to wrap your head around a little bit, uh, and that's also a bit of a trick that, that is maybe a bit unique to this HARPS, uh, to this, uh, to this HARPS data, uh, or at least this version of the cross correlation function, is that you can stack all of these orders together in a single matrix, because this summation over here does not care what spectral order or what wavelength any of my, any of my data pixels came from. As long as they're in the summation, it doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't even matter what, what order they are in. I mean, what, what like uh, chronological like um, ordering they're in. So I'm going to use a function called h stack to stack all of this together into a single uh, into a single array, a single two dimensional array that we can loop over for both the wavelength and the the flux. H stack list of waves, and I can actually uh, plot this wave to sort of show you what's happening. This is now one big array where the wavelength axis is going from order to order. And there's these jumps, but that doesn't matter for our cross correlation function because the interpolation will just interpolate wherever, whatever these wavelength values are. There could be gaps, there can be overlaps and that actually doesn't matter. Now, finally, the cross correlation function. Um, all we need to do is really fill in this equation over here. We have everything that we need to fill in this equation. We're just going to do that in a bit of a slow way. We can, we can write a matrix, matrix uh, multiplication to do that very fast, but this is a bit of the, the slow way to, 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 sh to sh show you what's happening. So we're going to do this for each of our real velocity steps. We're going to compute what this function is. So for each of our real velocities, we're going to say RV equals RVTI. Uh, I'm going to calculate my beta factor, which is Simply, I'm just going to type it that's faster, I think. One plus RV times U dot kilometer divided by U dot seconds uh, divided by constant C. Um, and then interpolate my, my template. So the interpolated template equals interp 1D, the wavelength of my template times this uh, Doppler factor um, and its flux that is evaluated on the wavelength grid of my data, which is this bit, big, big stacked stitched uh, wavelength axis. And then simply for each of my exposures, I'm going to evaluate the, the, the function. So it is my spectrum X, call it X if you want, X equals data J and CCF rho J velocity I equals NP dot sum X times FXTI divided by mp dot sum fxti. This is my cross correlation function. Equal sign, okay. Now, because this is slow, it takes a few seconds to do this. Um, depending on how large your data set is, this, this, this might take a bit longer or shorter. There's a very fast way of doing this that takes, that takes really just a few, a few tens of milliseconds. And uh, I think Matteo will use that uh, in a little bit. All right, now, one thing you might notice is that we have not done any transmission spectroscopy yet. We've just taken our data, which has the cellar spectrum in it, and we've cross-correlated it with a template. We have not never done any master out of transit spectrum. We've not divided by anything. And that's what we can actually do after the cross-correlation function. You don't need to do it before. You can do it before, but you don't need to. Um, let's first maybe show what the cross-correlation function looks like. It doesn't look like much, actually, uh, because what you're looking at is the average of my stellar spectrum averaged over all of these iron plus line positions. And because the, the stellar spectrum barely has any uh, features in it, you, bear, you, you, don't, you don't really see anything. Now, your eye might, might be drawn to this sort of slanted thing, and that's actually already the, the atmosphere of the planet. But we're going to make this clear by dividing through the time average of this cross correlation function, which is nothing more than a time average spectrum of the star, okay? Actually, actually, that's very easy because we can use the same NumPy trick as before. I'm now going to divide by the mean of my CCF uh, over axis zero this time. I don't need to do a, do a trans, uh, transpose trick in order to do this because these are already the rows over which I am dividing. And here you see our uh, cross correlation function, which is the main output of this uh, output of this uh, this uh, session. Um, that's very neat. So this is our signal. You can see that the the iron plus signal is slanted, which is what we expect. You can also see this feature over here, which is the Doppler shadow. Doppler shadow is something I haven't actually discussed. Uh, Julia has already said you need to always take this into account. 
We are not going to. Um, you can do this in multiple ways. You can fit Gaussians to this. You can forward model it and then take it out of your stellar spectrum. Um, the only last thing, which is step number six, that I want, I want to actually do, which takes two minutes, is to uh, actually show that this is uh, the atmosphere of the planet. We have to establish that this is actually co-moving with what we expect to be the planet's velocity at, at all times. And in order to do that, we need to have our orbital parameters. So these are the param parameters of the system that we use. Um, that is simply the period, the center major axis, the systemic velocity of the system, the RA and deck that we're looking towards because we want to uh, still uh, uh, take into account our bare center velocity and we need that. The transit center time to calculate where our phases are and the inclination of the orbit. Now the orbital velocity, as I said, uh, that's simply the, the, the equation of a, of a, of a circle. Um, I can print what that, what, I, what that is. And that's 250 kilometers per second. You see that Astropy unit has taken care of all my units. So this was an AU, this was in days, something in, in, in kilometer per second um, uh, comes out if you, if you tell it to. So that is really, really neat. The conversion to, or the calculation actually to, uh, to uh, of the phases needs to take into account the fact that we are on the earth and we have a light tra travel delay with respect to the bare center. This is a transit center time that you find in a paper, which is very typically given in BJD. You have to convert there. So we had that function that I, that I provided for you uh, to do that. Uh, it simply takes a list of MJDs, which we have conveniently created an RA and deck, um, and that's going to convert our, 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 our times, which is typically a couple of minutes, actually, that's that, that, uh, that uh, uh, difference. The time difference between our observations and the transit center time um, uh, is this, uh, the MJ2, I guess, yes. Um, so this is the number of days that has elapsed since our observations, between our observations and the transit center time. Of course, we're interested in how many periods have elapsed in order to compute the phases. So I can say divide by period. Um, I think that will just work. Yes, so this is the number of orbits that have elapsed since our transit center time. And that produces a phase if I, um, that's actually the orbital phase already, um, with a large four factor. So these, uh, these decimals are the, are the, are the phases, are the orbital phases of our, of our planet. So how do we then create real velocities? Well, we simply fill in that equation that we had up there. Um, if I had, I would, uh, if I had it, I would copy it, but I'll just type it, type it over real quick. So that's uh, pi times this phase which doesn't care that it is a very large number because it will just uh, it will just loop over because, because this is a sine function. I multiply by the orbital velocity, 250 kilometers per second, and I multiply by the sine of the inclination, which is almost one because this is a transiting planet. Um, that's in degrees, so I probably have to convert uh, that to radians, inclination, um, and there we go. This is the rate of velocity of our planet as expected from the orbital parameters, okay? Uh, phase is not defined because I have to, of course, assign it here. All right, this is a astropy unit. I have to extract the value in order to make this work. Okay, now, all we need to do now is overplot. So we have the CCF divided by the average CCF, and we overplot the radial velocity of the planet for each of our exposures. And you can see that there's a shift. Uh, the slant, we get it right, but there's a shift. And that's, of course, because we haven't taken into account the systemic velocity. So if I add the systemic velocity to this um, in units of kilometer divided by second, you'll see that we start shifting towards the, the, the uh, actual velocity. We're still not exactly there because there's another component that's the barycentric velocity, which we also read in from the header at the very start. We're now going to finally use that. Um, to shift to the exact velocity that we expect. So the dashed line now indicates the expected velocity of the atmosphere of Kelp line B, and we see a deep, significant, very strong signature overlapping exactly with this slant. And that's how we can say with absolute certainty that this is iron plus in the atmosphere of Kelp line B, because it is having the correct wavelengths to have those lines, because we add, use those to, to add up, and it is moving at the correct velocity as we expect from parameters that we know. And with that, I would like to end. Um, sorry, Matteo, for going a little bit over time. I hope that this gives you at least all the handles that you need to do this in the infrared. Uh, Matteo, please, please don't rush. If you if you go over five ten minutes, it's absolutely no problem. I'm sure everybody is happy to to stay five minutes more to 
See what's yeah, going on. I'll try to keep it as light as possible being at the end of the session. We'll see. There's some coding as well. So I'll, I'll try to share my screen first. Okay. Uh, Hold on. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm also going to cheat because I'm going to code with you, but to avoid unnecessary delays, I got another window. My, I had to switch which seat um, my, my office wasn't, wasn't usable. Uh, so it's a little bit of an impro improvised setting, but we'll, we'll make it work uh, with you. Um, so we're going to switch to the infrared. So the thing that I've done uh, in the meantime is to uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, HRCCS underscore with blanks. So if you downloaded the, um, uh, the, the zip file uh, that I linked, um, you can just unzip that and everything should run. Um, the folder structure is already defined. Uh, and so you should be able to follow along. And there's also a version that I also have uh, loaded here. HRCCS, which contains the full code. So in case we got some issues, um, you know, stuff that I uh, maybe cannot sort out, we can just copy paste from, uh, from there and it should work. All right, let's get started. Uh, we're gonna switch to the infrared. So we're still gonna talk about cross-correlation uh, high resolution spectroscopy. So sometimes I, uh, you'll see I use this HRCCS, you'll see in the literature uh, because this comes from high resolution cross-correlation spectroscopy. Uh, now, looking at the infrared uh, rather than in the optical, we have seen this already with uh, Elia's introduction, uh, but also we talked about tellurics many times already today. Once you push your observations to the one micron region here, you start seeing all sorts of telluric absorption, which is uh, um, behaving in a sort of nasty way. Um, and most of it is going to be saturating. Um, so you've got to think about how to analyze your data in a slightly different way. So tellurics are going to be a very prominent feature of your infrared spectra. And this means you cannot simply uh, either ignore them or you cannot just uh, immediately shift to the barycentric uh, frame or to the stellar frame, forgetting about the telluric lines because otherwise they're gonna give you a, a big headache to detect any exoplanet signal. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is to switch from transmission to emission spectroscopy. So you've heard about transmission uh, extensively uh, today. Uh, so what I'm doing here is to um, switch to emission, which means I'm essentially half an orbit later. Now, some of you who are uh, used to think about uh, um, emission spectroscopy uh, in light curves, you know that what you do uh, you essentially monitor the lights, uh, you wait for the planet to be occulted by the star and to reappear, and you can determine the emission spectrum from the missing flux during secondary eclipse. Now, if you have been following along everything we do with high resolution spectroscopy, we know uh, that we normalize the spectra, so we lose any information about transits or secondary eclipses. So we cannot uh, derive the emission spectrum of the planet like this. Uh, we don't have any secondary eclipses anymore. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we use the uh, Doppler shift as has been shown in transmission. We also use it in emission. So let me show you again. Now my window is a little is a little small to fit the entire uh, plot, but you have seen this uh, from Nuria already. Um, they have been talking about transmission spectroscopy. So this part of orbital phase zero. I'm going to be talking about the part uh, that is around uh, orbital phase 0.5. Now, as you can see, the lines of the exoplanets are still shifting when you're observing a hot Jupiter. Uh, now, if you were observing during secondary eclipse, you would see nothing. So what we do is just observe before or after secondary eclipse. But also, uh, this gives you an extra opportunity since you do not need the secondary eclipse anymore to do your observation. You can also observe non-transiting planets, right, in emission, as long as you target them around phase 0.5, which is when they are fully illuminated, when you should see most of the, uh, of the emission spectrum coming uh, towards you. Um, apologies for these lack uh, notifications. Let me actually close this for a moment. Yeah, if anyone has some questions or in the chat, I'm not much in the chat, I'm, I'm still some of, I'm seeing some of the videos, so please interrupt me in any, in any moment. Um, all right, so step one, 
actually the, the previous speakers, lectures that they, they've done, um, they, they, they've shown a lot of these steps. So that makes my life ultra easy uh, to explain what I'm gonna do now. So the first step is to load the data. The data we are gonna play with uh, is, is uh, real data from a hot Jupiter that is non-transiting. This is called HD 1799.9b. And this data I've been working during my PhD. Um, so you can find a link to the publication here. Uh, which should open a different window. Uh, so for those of you curious, just go and, and check that. Uh, also, I put a link to Simbad just to show you that this is a very bright star. Uh, the star is actually infrared magnitude five, it even go, goes below five. So this is a very bright star. Um, and uh, nevertheless, we actually spent about 14 hours of VLT time on this target to get the six sigma detection that I published in the paper at five point, not, not really six sigma, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and these are, uh, this data is divided in three nights. So this, we observed three different nights. Uh, you can find the data in the subfolders, night one, night two, night, and night three. All right, so the very first thing uh, that I'm gonna do is to uh, load in the data. Rather than being lazy and doing it three times, I actually just wrote a small function. There's nothing really to understand here. This function goes into the right folder. Uh, it takes the fluxes, it takes the wavelength solution, it takes the air mass of the observations, the orbital phases, and it returns all of these. Uh, all of these. The only thing that you'll notice is that it returns a, a cropped version of one of the axes, which I explain in a minute. And that's because with the old Kryos, one of the detectors of the instrument was suffering by some nonlinearity effects. So we normally uh, threw that away. So we were not when you're using that uh, the detector. So that's why you see a little bit of slicing here. So as you can see, I'm just getting the vectors for the nights by specifying the folder of my data and I get fluxes, wavelengths, air mass, uh, radio velocities and phases. Okay, let's see, uh, let's run this and um, let me plot some of this information. So all this I just wrote down, like there's nothing to, to write live. All right, so here's orbital phase against air, air mass against orbital phase. And here's a combination of systemic and the barycentric velocities. Now you know about those, so you know what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the velocity of the system of the star as a whole, um, minus the velocity of the uh, uh, Earth's observatory or Earth's observer in the body center of the solar system, right? right? So for this specific night, you can see the air mass varies widely from 2.5 to essentially one. So air mass one is when you point at the zenith. Um, air mass two is when you are about 30 degrees above the horizon. So it really tracks the motion of the object, object on the sky. And, and also these uh, velocities vary. So before it was mentioned that the barycentric component is not a very prominent component, but it still varies in a few hours of observations by about a, hundred, a few hundreds meters per second. So something that you cannot really neglect um, in your observations. Now, what happens here, as uh, some of you with a good eye will spot a little gap here, is that the VLT cannot really track um, when it's very close to zenith. So because this target almost got to the zenith, we had to stop the observations for um, half an hour. So I, don't, I don't really know how, how much, it's probably 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and wait for the target to go down a little bit and restart the observation. So all this type of diagnostic, I'm putting myself into say my, my shoes as a PhD student. So I, I would be checking all these things just to make sure that it makes sense, um, that everything looks, uh, looks good. Um, okay. so. Uh, the, on, the only advice that I have for you before we start with the actual coding is make sure you always check this paricentric component because most of the times this is the velocity of the observer measured in the body center of the solar system. So to, to get the other way around, to get the velocity of your target in your re reference frame, you have to switch the sign, hence the minus sign. However, if you go on the web and use like various um, functions for that, occasionally you will come across to cases in which the body centric component is the velocity of the solar system body center in your uh, observer's frame. So om, om, always check because in that case you need a plus sign, not a minus sign. So most of the times you'll be fine with a minus sign, but just double check that this is applied, uh, applied consistently. Okay, so. 
Uh, the first things that I'm going to do are to get the dimensions on the data. I don't want to be typing, you know, the length of the observations or the number of pixels. Or, so I'll, I'll get in the dimension from uh, my fluxes already. Uh, and I'll print that in a moment. I'll explain. And also, because I'm lazy, I'll write a plot function that plots all my matrices of data uh, every time I need to, to show you the different stages of the data analysis. Um, and this function simply takes uh, the matrix to, pl to plot uh, X and Y axes, the labels if I want to, or the X and Y axes. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm also adding a little bit of stretching, color stretching, because when we go forward with analysis, it'd be handy to actually stretch the color scheme to highlight any deviations from, say, imperfect telluric removals, or et cetera. So, um, it doesn't really matter what is written here. You can write your own. It's just like, um, uh, yeah, probably I should also put a return uh, here uh, just to be a, a proper coder uh, in, the, in this function. And uh, what I'm doing essentially, I'm just looping all the, the um, uh, let's call orders of the data. These are not orders, are detectors. I'll show you a difference in a moment. And I'm just plotting uh, the data how it's uh, circanized. So let's do that. Okay. so. You essentially get something that you have seen already in, um, in the transmission spectroscopy data. So what I have on the X axis here is the uh, wavelength of my observations. And what I have on the Y axis is uh, time or orbital phase, or uh, because these observations were taken sequentially, so we have continuous observation, that, that would be also the spectrum num the, the number of the, of the spectrum observed. So, um, spectrum number one would be the earlier time and the last spectrum in the sequence would be uh, up here. Um, these are three. Uh, so let me let me show you the dimension of this. Uh, remember that I asked for the shape and I plotted it and I printed it. So these are three detectors. So the spectral range that is covered by Cryris is split into three detectors. So think about these as the orders previously, but this time uh, we have the, we don't have a cross disperse, we don't have orders in the spectrum. The spectrum is linear. We just divide them in chunks. And uh, um, 199 is how many spectra we have. So the number of observations for these night, this night. And 1024 is how many pixels each detector has has. Each pixel is a wavelength, so uh, that axis is also wavelength for, for us. Um, now, uh, some of you, if you want to know, uh, this is unquote, since we are a little bit late in time, um, these numbers here um, don't mean anything specific unless you know what they mean. Uh, so in, in, for Cryers, uh, these counts are ADUs per second of integration. So if you want to do, you know, your uh, photon statistics, you would have have to multiply by the exposure time, then by the gain on the detector, and you will have how many photoelectrons were recorded on the, on the detector uh, for each of the exposures. Now, there's two things I want to point out here. Uh, so let me see, uh, let me check uh, so that I, I, don't, uh, I don't forget anything. Okay, so the first thing that I want to point out is that um, there's a lot more vertical lines here than in any of the spectra you have seen uh, earlier. So these are the telluric lines. This is the exact demonstration that telluric lines are non negligible um, in the infrared. However, there is hope because at this spectral resolution, you can see that most of the telluric lines are unblended and there's enough space in between to still do spectroscopy. So, you know, sometimes you, you hear that um, from the ground is very hard to do uh, to observe in the infrared. That's good. That's true in photometry, but in spectroscopy with enough resolution, you can actually peek in between the telluric lines and still do science. The second thing that you'll probably notice is that the level of each one of these spectra. So if you if you check like the color of each one of these rows, uh, that varies wildly, and that's not only because we are observing through different M masses or so different altitudes. So the object, the star has to go through less or more atmosphere, but it's also because uh, the pointing is imperfect and not always uh, is the same amount of light entering our spectrograph. So there's a little bit of wobbling around um, and, and, and that causes actually the flux to vary over the time scale of an exposure. So um, it makes it impossible essentially to reproduce a light curve, uh, just like spectrophotometry at high spectral resolution. You, you cannot do that because first of all, you don't have a reference star. And even if you had it, 
your flux is always changing because different amount of light enters the seed. So forget about it. Let's let's take a different approach. Um, so what is the different approach? Oh yeah, I should also mention another thing here is that Cryris wasn't a particularly stable instrument uh, when it was uh, working. So, so far you have been used to have like uh, your wavelength solution and your spectra always aligned uh, along the sequence. This is what you have here. So a telluric line with a certain wavelength in this data will always fall on the same pixel, but that's because I have been realigning all the spectra um, to do that. Um, if you, if I show you the original data, you will see that the spectra were wobbling around uh, 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 around the vertical axis. And that's because the spectrograph does not always have these spectral lines on the same pixel. So you have to, sometimes you have to correct for those in the infrared, but with modern spectrographs like Carmen and Spiru, uh, you don't have these issues. So that's why I started from this stage because it's very likely that uh, with any modern spectrographs you will be playing with, the data will come out um, more or less in this format. So this is what you will start uh, with. Yeah, without, without further ado, let's uh, dive into the removal of telluric lines. So let me uh, make sure I'm not writing stupid things. So uh, I'm gonna keep the code uh, close to me so I can, I can actually double check. Okay, so the first thing you have seen it already. So the first step of the data analysis is to remove this spectrum to spectrum variation. How do we do that? We do that by normalizing each spectrum in the sequence by the continuum. So let me write this very quickly. I could have also copied and pasted the code because uh, you've seen it twice already. Uh, so let's say um, I want to create a, a median uh, spectrum. Uh, that contains uh, the median of my flux. Uh, and which ax axis should I, uh, should I pick? Well, I want to measure the continuum around, along the wavelength axis. So I'm gonna use the median as a rough proxy for the, uh, for the continuum. Sorry, I'm gonna use the, the median as a, yeah, as, a, as a rough proxy for the continuum. So I'm gonna take the median along the second axis, sorry, which is the wavelength. So remember, uh, zero is uh, detectors, one is time, and two is, uh, uh, is wavelengths. Um, so why am I saving this? It's because I also want to use a uh, British keyboard. I also want to use this for uh, um, weighting uh, later on each of the wavelengths of my spectrum. So I'm going to save this. So I'll say uh, median is proxy or continue. Then I'm going to do a double loop. Uh, the first loop is for is over the detectors uh, and bits, and the second loop is over uh, uh, time. So for I ops, I normally use uh, very cryptic indices. I'm not really used to programming this uh, this up from way, so it'll take me a little bit longer uh, in range um, and ops. Uh, and what we're going to do is very simply to divide a uh, flux of I ops, sorry, I depth, I ops. So I'm going to slice uh, each spectrum and divide it by the median flux of this exact same indices. Now, uh, I did all that work to write my function that plots uh, things. Um, so let me also, okay, so sorry. Uh, what I wanna, this, this is fine, but actually because I have three nights, I want to write a function that does this. So I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna write a function that is uh, normalize continue. And this function is going to take um, um, flux, and um, I'm also going to have a, a keyword that decides whether to plot uh, or, or not. And that's going to be set to false um, in case I don't want to plot anything. So the rest stays the same. I'm going to take this, this, um, that. My computer is a bit lagging at the moment. Uh, then the other thing I need to choose if to plot or not. So if plot, I'm gonna use uh, plot matrix function and the plot matrix uh, takes uh, flux of I that. Uh, what do I want to give you the wavelength? So I'm gonna show you 
uh, the, the right wavelengths as well, uh, the orbital phase in the y axis, and then um, left me wavelength, and this is in nanometers, and uh, phases, um, and what else? And that's it. Then once this is done, I'm going to return uh, my uh, normalized flux and also my median flux so that um, I can say I can use it later. So uh, I'm going to call this F flat, so flux flattened, uh, and median flux uh, is going to be normalized continuum of flux. Uh, yeah, and the keyword worked, but actually I want to plot something this time. Yeah, so here, here it is. So as you have seen, we, we essentially removed all the uh, variations in time of, of flux. Now, this is all good. Um, they are approximately normalized. Those of you who have a good eye will already spot that. Uh, now, if you look at a particular telluric line, it seems to be slightly broader, um, but it's not broader, it's actually deeper at the beginning and the end of the sequence and slightly uh, less deep uh, um, at the center of the, of, of the sequence. And that's expected is because the depth of telluric lines is changing uh, during the night. So uh, what I wrote here is a little piece of code that takes uh, one pixel of the first detector of Cryrus, uh, one pixel that is approximately around the continuum, and one pixel that is approximately or, uh, at, the, at the center of, of a telluric line. So you can see here, maybe you cannot see that very well, but the orange star is approximately in the continuum, and the blue star is approximately at the center of the line. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of normalization. I'm going to show you how the flux in these two pixels, in these two wavelengths, changes with time. So you've got the continuum in orange that stays not exactly, but largely constant during the night. Whereas uh, in the core of a telluric line in blue, there's a huge variation. Now you've seen this already, you know what's going on here. Um, the, the most likely culprit of this is uh, geometric air mass. You're observing through different layers, different thickness of the Earth's atmosphere throughout the night. And the lower is your target, um, the higher is the absorption in the, in the core of telluric lines. In the continuum, because the opacity is, uh, ne is negligible compared to the core of the line, this effect is also negligible, is non-zero. Those of you with a good eye might have spotted that the behavior seems to be the opposite here, but it's just a result of my imperfect normalization. It should continue should be roughly, roughly flat. Okay, so. What I'm going to show you is that um, there is a um, um, easy fix that you might think to do. Okay, let's get rid of all these telluric lines by just taking a time average of the spectra, like people were doing transmission spectroscopy in the optical, and let's just divide by it. So um, if I were a PhD student, I go to my supervisor and I say, I can do that, I can, I can take the average out. And my supervisor at the time, Inya Snell, will say, no, 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 Matteo, this, is, this will not work. So I want to convince myself that it's not working. And, and this is what I'm going to try. So I'm going to take a copy of the first detector. I'm going to create a, a time average of it. Uh, and uh, for each spectrum in the sequence, I'm going to divide by the time average. And let's plot the result. I'm taking a copy just because I don't want to modify any of the, any of the data I'm, uh, I'm doing. Ah, Ineos was right. It's not. Uh, it's not possible to. Uh, uh, it's not possible to just normalize the spectra. Uh, well, it's not surprising because I showed you that uh, this is really varying in time. So you can hardly think that uh, a time average of this will will take out uh, telluric line. Okay. So the, what do we do? So we go to the next step. Uh, you know that air mass is probably the culprit for this. So why don't we try to plot if there's any correlation between air mass and the depth of that telluric line that I, uh, that I measure? Well, let's try that. And uh, you can see, oh, wow, yes, there is a correlation. Let's try, let's try first a linear fit. So um, what I've done here, I, I merged together many things. So I uh, took my X and Y vectors at the air mass and the, and the flux in the, in the telluric line. And then I computed a polynomial fit between these two uh, of degree one. 
then because I'm lazy and I don't want to compute the function by myself. So I use poly 1D to compute the polynomial that, that, that goes behind the function. And I evaluated this polynomial with the MOS again, and then plot it on top of the data. So yeah, it's, it's approximately working. So the very tight correlation between uh, the depth of a telluric line and the geometric uh, mass of the observations. However, you'll see that the correlation is not perfect. Um, what can I do? Can I go to degree two? Uh, yeah, let's try to go to degree two. Ah, okay, that's, that's already better. Some of you who know about radiative transfer might actually say, well, Matteo, this is not actually properly done. Because if you think about the radiative transfer uh, uh, across the slab material, what you should have is that um, your, uh, uh, your flux goes with the exponential of the air mass. Well, let's try if this is uh, true. If now I do, let me do it with the flux, um, the logarithm of the flux, uh, and I limit myself to uh, degree one again. Uh, yes, indeed, this is a little bit of a better fit. So you can choose whether uh, you prefer to work in uh, logarithmic or exponential space or in linear. Um, sometimes none of them works. So that's why to keep things simple, I'll just work in linear space and just use an order, a second order polynomial um, in the code that I'm going to, to write. Okay, so let's write some uh, live code to detrend uh, our spectra uh, by M. So since we want to reuse this function as well, as well uh, I'm going to call a function detrend to Durek. Um, it's going to take um, an X vector, which might be Hermas, but might be something different if you want to test something different too. It's going to take a data cube. Um, so our cube of data that we have just normalized uh, is going to default to a degree two of the polynomial if we don't specify anything else and also has the usual keyword for, for plotting which is set to false uh, if we don't want to plot anything. Okay, so let's uh, just for the sake of it, uh, let's retake the dimensions of this um, of this factor. Uh, why do I do that? It's because when I shift night, I want to make sure that all these functions update the dimensions for, uh, for nights that are different from, from the first one. Uh, so this is going to be cube uh, dot shape again. Uh, then we are gonna create a copy. Uh, we're gonna create um, a temporary storage um, space for our telluric remove data, which is just going to be a copy of the, of the cube. Uh, and now I'm going to do I'm going to, I'm going to do double loop. So the first loop is going to be again uh, over the um, detectors. The second loop, remember when we normalize the continuum, we were looping over time. Now we have to loop over wavelength. So it's going to be for uh, i picks in range n picks. Okay, so let's see what I'm going, I'm going to do here. So first thing we are going to compute the, um, let's me do into, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to look at the, let me first compute the coefficients of the fit. So this is going to be np.polyfit uh, xvec uh, cube of uh, i that uh, the time axis, I'm going to take the whole time axis and i picks uh, and with the degree specified by that. Then I'm going to build a fit by using np.poly 1D. This is a very slow way of doing that. There's a much faster way, but uh, for, for the purposes of this, it's, it's better to do it like this. Um, uh, build a polynomial function and then evaluate that at the values of x vec. And last but not least, I'm going to divide, uh, I'm going to set the values of my telluric removed uh, vector to the ratio between the cube. Let me just well copy this and the fit. Uh, same thing here. If plot, um, let me plot matrix. Uh, this is going to be TRAM of I that uh, wavelength phases. 
um, well, I, I, won't, I won't write anything on the axis this, this time, but I want the color code to be stretched so I can show you well uh, what's happening. And last, I'm gonna return the gram. Uh, and obviously I'm gonna call this the Lurix, otherwise it won't work later. Uh, Emma's uh, F flat, which was a continuum normalized and uh, degree equal to, uh, I'm gonna specify. Uh, what did I do here? Yeah, forgot a, all right. So by detrending via N mass, we pass from this situation here in which the lyrics were overly dominant to this situation here. Oh yeah, the depth, no, notice the depth of these telluric, telluric lines goes to 20% uh, of the continuum. So nearly saturated, sometimes they actually saturate, so they go to zero. To this situation here, in which your data is plus or minus one and a half percent, two percent. So you have indeed gotten rid of a lot of telluric lines, but not completely. The reason for this is that AMAS is not a optimal proxy for the depth of telluric lines. If you have water lines, for instance, in the Earth's atmosphere, you can have sudden changes into the amount of precipitable water vapor that do not correlate with air mass. Uh, and so this is also a level of correction that we would achieve typically if you were to apply molecular fit uh, to, uh, uh, to these data. Uh, and this is what we are gonna deal with. I, I can see the raised hand, I'll, I'll uh, ask in a moment. Um, this is also what we are gonna stop here. We're gonna deal with, with this level of correction. You could uh, apply as, range of other algorithms that are blinder than this to further detrain the data. And indeed I did that in 2014, I further detrained that. But for the sake of showing you what happens if you go on with this, uh, we'll do a little bit of a, uh, say by hand fix to this by masking those noisy spectral channels. Uh, Nick, Nick uh, there's this question from you, I see. Uh, yeah, so um, you said that the flux dropped down to 0 0.2. Um, is there any, risk this method wouldn't work if you had a zero value, like say there is zero for like, like getting an infinite thing. Okay. Yeah, you would have to, um, so either when you have zero values or uh, very, very close to zero, or you have none values in your matrix, you always have to make sure to create a mask of those, uh, those pixels. And then you have to write a slightly more complicated code that takes into account which of the uh, parts of your parts of your data are masked or not. Uh, yeah, this, this is good. What, what, one, one easy fix you, you, you could do is to set that to one, say to the normalized continuum temporarily, but still keep track of those columns. And at the end of the sequence, remask those. Um, if you really want to make your life easy, you don't want to carry like checking all the NANS values or mass values during, during your data. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It, will, it, it happens very often with uh, in different wavelength ranges that you have that, uh, that case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, here again, um, okay, let's see if we can design a brute force mask for the purposes of this tutorial uh, that essentially masks the noisiest of these spectral channels. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a copy of the first crisis detector and computing the standard deviation as a proxy for a quality of the correction along, the, along each column of the data, so along the time axis. And I am also plotting that together with a threshold. So I'm, I'll show you in a moment what this means. Okay, so for this first detector of Cryres, you can see that most of the pixels were actually corrected to a certain threshold, to a certain base value, baseline value of standard deviation. This is not surprising. This would be like a um, standard deviation that could come from uh, photon noise statistics if the source is, is very bright or a combination of your, uh, you know, photon noise, uh, uh, detector, uh, readout noise, um, whatever you have. So this floor is set in the continuum, in the continuum is actually quite easily achieved. But in the core of the lines, either because the lines are, uh, have less flux, so the noise, the, 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 the photon noise is higher, 
or because you haven't corrected them correctly, which also leads to higher noise, or a combination of the two, uh, you get these spikes. So it means like in, in some of these spectral channels in your data and some at some specific wavelengths, you've got much, much noisier data than say the rest of it. So what I trace here, I try to say, what if I take, for instance, the median of the standard deviation as a sort of, uh, let me put this to one, uh, as a sort of proxy for where this baseline level is. And what if I decide to mask everything that is two times uh, above the uh, median? Uh, well, yeah, this will work. Uh, it would also work if you go a little bit less than that. Um, you can convince yourself there's no much difference on the on the exact threshold. This is also a ad hoc solution for the for the tutorial. Um, I don't recommend to get to the final version of the paper like this. I would rather develop something that is more automated. But I'll show you what happens if you do the least invasive of the things, which is just masking these noisy like noisy lines which might also come handy if you want to use molec fit, you know, and you want to apply to this data, you don't need to do ultra precise. Let's try to just mask whatever doesn't work well with, uh, with molec fit. So let's write this mask. Now, this is really gonna take me a little bit of time. So what I'm gonna do, apologies for that. I'm gonna take this mask code from here and, uh, uh, and actually copy and paste. Uh, I'm gonna explain to you what the code does though. Uh, don't worry. Uh, let me switch. Oh, yeah, I didn't actually need the last two lines. So I've done this. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote a function uh, that is called mask residuals uh, with a threshold parameter, which is exactly the threshold that I show you now. Um, it's going to take the shape again. It's going to set the, the normalized matrix around zero just for uh, masking purposes. Uh, and it's going to compute all the pixels looping over the detector is going to compute all the pixels that are above the thresholds, threshold, and also all the pixels that are below a certain threshold. This I didn't explain, it's because I initially masked some of these pixels, but I did not carry this mask. So this is a way for me to find out which pixels were masked previously. So nothing to worry about. Um, and I'm going to set those pixels to zero. Uh, in addition to that, for the pixels that are not masked, I'm going to divide them to weight them by their standard deviation. Now, why am I wait? Why the hell am I weighting the data? So, I, one, am I? Why am I doing something like that? The reason is that uh, in Jens's case, the data was untouched, so you were getting less flux where the detector was receiving less flux, and more flux where the detector was more efficient. So, remember how the this the, this, the efficiency of each of the orders of your spectrograph was preserved. In my case, I have renormalized everything to one. So if I don't do anything to the data, when I compute the cross correlation function, I'm going to weight equally all the wavelengths. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to apply the weighting that I previously calculated through the uh, um, through my, um, so I could do that. I'm going to apply the weighting that is, uh, um, that is uh, basic, a proxy for this weighting in the standard deviation of the data. I'm going to apply, apply to each of the spectral channels. Why do I have square here and not just the, the uh, not just the weighting? It's because it's a template matching, right? So whatever you do to the data, you should do to your uh, to your template. So if I'm weighting the data, I should also weight my model when I do cross correlation. By double weighting the data, I avoid that they have to do I have to do that that a second at a second time. So it's just like a matter of being lazy and not uh, having to redo that on the on the model. Anyway, uh, just going to show you very quickly how this looks like. Uh, you can get back to the code. You can ask me any questions if you want to. So it's still quite noisy, but not as noisy as it was uh, before. So that was the previous mask pre prior to masking, and this is now after masking. So I am happy with this version also because it's five or it's five over here and six over uh, Central European time. Um, so I'm going to proceed to the uh, cross correlation, uh, which is going to get interesting, uh, the interesting part. So first of all, let me load the model that I will be using for cross correlation. Uh, this is nothing different from the models you have seen so far, except that it's an emission model. Uh, and it contains mostly carbon monoxide. So this nice sequence of lines is carbon monoxide. And these uh, smaller lines here are water vapor. So a mixture of CO and uh, NH2O uh, in this spectrum. The other point I wanna make here 
is that I'm going to use a, a spline interpolation uh, rather than a, a linear interpolation. The reason is that um, sometimes in the past and uh, still today, if you want to be very, very fast, your computer model that is um, not under sample, but it's not really over sample compared to the data. So you have to care about uh, doing interpolation errors and using a spline interpolation is actually a better approximation for your model than using a linear approximation. Um, the other reason, which uh, I'm not going to explain, but you'll find it in the notebook, is that uh, spline interpolation done through the uh, interpolate.spl rep and spl EV allows you to split the interpolation into steps and you can do one uh, outside of the loops. So speeding up the code and the other one inside the loop. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that in the code um, that I, so it's, it's also a reason of, of speed that I, um, the reason why I'm doing that. Okay, so let's write the cross correlation function. Now my cross correlation function is slightly different from Jens's. Uh, at the numerator, you have exactly the same thing. So you take the product between data and model the model being shifted by a variable uh, radial velocity, and you sum up all those pixels. At the denominator though, in my case, you've got a normalization factor. Um, this uh, summation of uh, the um, product, of, summation of the, of the square of the data and summation of the square of the model. Those are called the data variances and the model variances, statistical variances and uh, allows you to renormalize the cross correlation function so that if the correlation is perfect, you get plus one. If there's zero correlation, you get zero. If there is perfect anti-correlation, so you are cross correlating an emission line with an absorption line, you get minus one. Um, it's just a matter of choices. Uh, so the slow code, which is the same as Jens's, would be uh, take the length of the vector, subtract the mean, uh, this is the other difference from Jens's code. This version has the mean subtracted from both models and data. Uh, take the numerator, so the sum of the products, uh, compute the two variances and return uh, exactly the same formula. So the numerator divided by the square root of the product of the two variances. Um, um, yeah, we are a bit late on time. So I'm just gonna post here the faster version. Uh, where is it? here. Uh, the faster version of this um, realizes that every time you do this, every time you take the product of two elements of a vector, and then you sum up the whole vector, you're essentially doing a dot product between a vector and uh, between the two vectors. So you can get much faster, uh, actually up to 10 times faster, if you use uh, dot products between, uh, between matrices. Uh, I'm using the NP dot dot, uh, which is equivalent to the at operator for those of you in Python 3. Um, there's other ways also for a higher dimensionality that this works. Anyway, look into this because it can speed up a code uh, significantly. Uh, let me show you that this is true. Now, in this case, there are other things uh, that, that, will, uh, um, that will matter. Uh, Am I doing this test? Oh yeah. So the last thing that is uh, left for us to write is the code that does the cross correlation. So Jens has just showed you, to you that. So I'm not going to rewrite it from scratch um, as he did. I'm going to select a number of cross correlation values, a radio velocity lag. Uh, I'm gonna print this in a second. You'll see like between minus 250 and plus 250 kilometers per second in steps or so 1.5 kilometers per second. I'm going to loop over the number of detectors and over the radio velocities, compute the shift of my model, cross correlate and store the cross correlation, the cube, exactly like Jens uh, did for the optical data. So I'm just going to run this, uh, this part here. It's just reminding me that I'm cross correlating over a fixed grid between minus 250 and plus 250. I also added a few considerations here. If you want to further speed up the code, you can do that. Now you can use the property that I told you. You can split SPL rep and SPL F. However, you have to rethink about this in a slightly different way. In particular, you have to change reference system. So you have to shift the data wavelengths rather than the model wavelengths. I don't wanna confuse you further. So look into this. If you have any questions on why I'm switching the sign or why this works, please um, send me a message. I'd be happy to 
to explain this. The only thing I want to show you, it might or might not work because obviously the laptop is doing other things in, this, in the meantime. I, I'm running the two versions just to show you the difference in computational time in this, in this case. It's obviously not coming only from the cross-correlation function, but also from the spline interpolation done in different ways. Uh, so we got the slow version is 15.2 seconds and uh, the faster version is about one third of the time. Um, so it doesn't seem much, but when you had to run a code for a hour and you get 20 minutes instead, it's, um, it's, it's actually quite a noticeable difference. And you can be even faster uh, if you want to. Okay, so the last step that I'm going to do is to take all of the cross correlations that I've computed as a function of radio velocity, time, and detector, and just co add all the three detectors of price. I, I could have done it that before and uh, calculated already in the cross correlation. It, it, they operate, the cross correlation is linear, so it doesn't really matter when you do that. Uh, for me, conceptually, it makes, uh, it makes more sense to do it now. And uh, and here you have it. So this is the last step of Jens's um, uh, part. Uh, you can see two major differences here. Absolutely no planet signal here. So you don't, we cannot see anything at the moment. And a very noisy cross-correlation function with a lot of these, these vertical stripes. Now, the vertical stripes are there because we did not really remove telluric lines very effectively. So even if we are cross-correlating with CO, they should not correlate with telluric lines we still get some spurious correlation. So imagine if you were looking for pure water, what would happen there or for methane, which is also in the exoplanet, in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, nevertheless, we can hope that at some level here, there's going to be buried our uh, exoplanet signal. So what can we do to actually get this? We can try to sum the cross correlation functions in time or average them in time in order to enhance our signal to noise ratio. However, in order to do that, you have to know where the planet's radio velocity is, right? Remember, you are in the telluric frame. So every telluric line will correlate as a vertical line here because it does not move with radio velocity. But as Jens showed you, uh, any uh, planetary signal would be a slanted line because the planet the planet radio velocity changes as a function of time. So in order to convince your to convince you that this is true, I've been applying the same formula: the systemic minus pericentric velocity plus uh, the orbital component of the exoplanet. Uh, I'm going to overplot some of these um, some of these radio velocity curves. We are not far from being from being finished, uh, and you can see that how, for instance, uh, the real one is the one in yellow. So the real exoplanet should be here, just because I know where the exoplanet is. Uh, you can play with two parameters here. You can change this value of kp, so the projected orbital velocity of the exoplanet, but you can also shift the radio velocity curve overall. Um, Right, across the sequence. So you can have an overall shift uh, in the systemic velocity or rest frame velocity, and you can have an overall change in the slope. So if the planet is transiting, you know exactly where to look for uh, plus or minus a few kilometers per second. So you are in luck. If the planet is non-transiting, you have a double uncertainty. You don't know the orbital inclination. So you don't know this value of Kp. Uh, and you don't know the slope, consequently, of your function. You also don't know exactly the orbital phase because uh, for a non-transiting planet, the zero point in phase is not very well defined. So the only thing you can do is to create a uh, co-edit cross-correlation function that explores these two parameters, or explores an overall offset of the cross-correlation function or an overall change in slope of the cross-correlation function. Um, this is also uh, referred to the shifting and co-adding uh, part of the cross-correlation function. And it creates those uh, KP versus VCs matrices that you, some of you might have seen uh, in some of the exoplanet publications. So I know it's late, but I'm going to write this part of the code. It's not, it's not very, uh, very long to write it, especially I'm gonna guide myself uh, with this. So this is going to be get velocity map, and then we are really uh, we are really done. Um, I'm gonna give it the the cross correlation function, uh, the weights, 
the radial velocity, uh, so the, the sum of the systemic, the systemic velocity minus the barycentric velocity, which is which changes with time, uh, the orbit of phases, and uh, a possible shift in phase uh, accounting for the uncertainty in orbital solution for a non-transiting planet. And I'm taking that from 2014 paper, so we don't have to uh, worry too much about that. Uh, and what we're going to do is to, um, um, to create a total cross-correlation function vector, which is uh, initialized to zeros and has dimensions uh, number of Kp, values, so all the KP values that we want to ex explore, and there are 81 of them, I've defined these vectors here, uh, and uh, number of different radial velocities, sorry, I, 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 there was Siri that was about to ask me something, uh, am I doing this uh, correctly? Yes, number of, of radial velocities. Now I'm going to loop over the KP vector uh, and KP. Uh, and going to double, uh, uh, with this loop, I'm going to compute what the radial velocity of my planet uh, would be, right, as a function of KP. So uh, my planet radial velocity uh, would be, actually, RVPL, I have to be consistent here with, uh, uh, is the, Systemic velocity minus barycentric velocity. So this R veil vector that I've been carrying uh, throughout the analysis. Uh, then, um, sorry, I lost a lot. Yeah, uh, my KP vec indexed with the AK, IKP times the sign of two times NP dot pi times the orbital phase. Uh, but because we want to account for a phase shift, I'm also going to include the d phi uh, here. So that's the uh, overall real velocity of my angstrom planet as a function of time for my selected value of kp. All right. So what do we have to do now is to shift, so interpolate these cross correlation functions to the planet's rest frame and sum in time. And uh, because we are requesting the interpolation not or at, at zero radial velocity, but in a range of radial velocity, we get the second axis of the rest frame velocity for free. You'll see, you'll see that uh, in a moment. Uh, so in this case, now looping over uh, time. So for I ops in range number of observations, uh, what we're going to do is to uh, compute the, uh, uh, to set our, uh, yeah, you see here, I, I've set a rest frame velocity. Um, actually, I should probably, I should have plotted. Let me plot this. Uh, split cells, let me plot this uh, the stuff here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I set my output uh, post interpolation vector to give me everything between minus 60 and plus 60 kilometers per second. So I just have to apply the radial velocity shift. So this is going to be, um, I, I lost completely the code. It's going to be the, my rest frame velocity. And then I have to account for the radial velocity of the planet, which is going to be uh, that one. And then I'm going to, um, uh, call my interpolate dot inter 1D. I'll, uh, if we're curious, I'll explain why I choose a 1D interpolation um, here. And uh, I just have to essentially shift the right cross correlation function, which is so uh, I had computed the cross correlation functions over real velocity lag, which was going between minus 250 to plus 50. Uh, this is the interpolation. And uh, uh, what I have to do is to store in the total cross, cross correlation function, I have to store, uh, remember I'm looping over time. So I have to store and sum over fit of my output radial velocity. So it's a bit of a strange way of doing interpolation, but essentially what I'm saying, I say like take this, Take the linear interpolation of the cross correlation function at time IOPS uh, and give me the same 
on an output radio velocity which is shifted by the planet's radio velocity. So effectively, I'm resecting all the wavelengths to be in the planet's rest frame and store this in the my final matrix and sum over time. Uh, remember, this was initialized to zero, so it's fine. It's fine to do that. Uh, and uh, I'm going to return the CCF dot. And then the last line, just to make sure I'm not messing up, not messing up, I'm gonna copy it from here. Um, oh wow, we got we got to the yeah this line here. Okay. All right. So there's no much code to write anymore. I'm just gonna show you uh, how this looks like, uh, and this looks like this. Now, remember the two parameters, uh, the rest frame velocity uh, was guiding the overall shift of the cross collision functions and the KP, maximal orbital radial velocity was guiding the slope. I've been co-adding this as a function of these two parameters and at 142 kilometers per second uh, and uh, roughly at the rest frame velocity of the flat planet, I've found a signal that has a signal to noise ratio of five. Uh, if you're going to the paper, uh, you can convince yourself that this is indeed uh, the exoplanet. However, 3.5, you might think this is not a very uh, significant detection. So let's, uh, what I've tried here now, like this, this basically you understand why I wrote all functions to do that, because what I tried to do that is to add an extra night, and I'm just going to run very quickly the code at the 9.3. Uh, then I'm going to stack all night one and night three, reorder everything and reapply exactly the same functions. So as you can see here, it's the same as before, but now there's two nights of data stacked in cross correlation. Going to repeat, uh, reuse my function. And uh, here it is. We have now four signal to noise. So indeed, we are significantly co adding. Like I add in an extra night and I pass from 3.5 in signal to noise uh, to four. Um, this is it. Um, I advise you to try to add the second night as well and see that it doesn't work and try to understand why it doesn't work. So go back to the very beginning, clear all the variables and actually look at night two rather than night one and try to understand why night two is misbehaving and why this uh, masking of tellurics as we did here, this rough masking hasn't worked. But this is not the point. The point is I wanted to show you how to essentially explore the two parameter space here. And I also wanted to show you how you might design an analysis that can co-add different nights uh, together. And um, if everything goes well, this should result in a higher signal to noise. Now we are really over time and I apologize for that. It's, uh, it's late in, uh, in Central Europe. so. Uh, I'll take any questions now, right. otherwise we'll be a Slack, whatever you want. Right, I think like uh, we can uh, leave, well, there's one quick question from Nicolas. So Nicolas, if you just want to ask it quickly. Oh, yeah. no, it's in, if you want to yes, no. Um, do you think it's possible to co-add both transit and emission KPV sys um, signals together? Uh, so it's possible to, um, it's, a good, it's a good one. Uh, it's possible to add the um, emission over a wide range of orbital phases. So you see this, this slanted slope here. If I would be adding a night that has a, a complementary orbital phase uh, before, before superior conjunction rather than after superior conjunction, that will cross the other way around. So you'll be localizing the planet signal uh, much better. The problem is that the same model wouldn't be a good approximation for the transmission spectrum. Uh, so you would need to compute the cross correlation functions with a different model, a model for transmission. And then in cross correlation space, once you have the cross correlation function, yeah, you could, you could think to co-add that. Um, assuming that the orbital velocity uh, is a good proxy for the actual planet radial velocity. If there are winds or the atmosphere does weird things, you know, between the emission or the transmission spectrum, that would not co add constructively, but um, it's certainly possible, yeah. Thanks. All right, so thank you very much, Jens and Matteo and all the other speakers that like uh, intervened today. And uh, if you have further questions, please don't forget that we have like a dedicated Slack channel for both of the, of the sessions we have today. 
and uh, um, just write it there your question and like we're gonna we're gonna answer so let's reconvene tomorrow at the same time 1 p.m and i guess at the same like zoom link uh Eliar, can you confirm that yeah great so at the same zoom link so have a nice evening or the rest of your day like wherever you are in the world <laughs> see ya bye thanks for joining thank you, thank you guys